Okay, then I would say let us begin and continue with our electroweak theory lecture. Uh, the last time we already began to discuss spontaneous symmetry breaking in the standard model and uh, how the masses are generated of the various particles. And we already looked at the masses of the vector bosons, the W and the Z boson. And the next topic is the generation of fermion masses, namely the masses of quarks and leptons. And remember that we currently only look at one generation of fermions, so one generation of leptons. And therefore, let us immediately begin by plugging in the expression in unitary gauge that we have obtained the last time. Unitary gauge means that we gauge away the unphysical components of the Higgs doublet, and what remains is only the physical Higgs field, which is real, and the vacuum expectation value, which is also real, in the lower component of the Higgs field. Maybe just to remember, the unitary gauge version of the Higgs doublet is this one. So the upper component is zero, the lower component is real, and is written as a constant V plus a Higgs field H, which depends on X, uh, normalized by square root of two. So if we plug this unitary gauge into the Yukawa Lagrangian, then we obtain the mass terms of uh, the quarks and leptons. So let us write it down, Yukawa in unitary gauge becomes, so the first Yukawa term is the one for the leptons, Ye, Yukawa coupling for the leptons, Ye times the left, let me do it for one term explicitly, L bar phi Er plus the Hermitian conjugate, okay, plus all the additional terms. And what happens if you plug in now the unitary gauge for the Higgs doublet? Only the lower component of phi is non-zero, the upper component vanishes. Therefore, in the multiplication with L bar, uh, L bar is also a doublet. In the upper component, it contains the neutrino. In the lower component, it contains the left-handed electron. So the neutrino drops out, it's multiplied with zero, and the left-handed electron is multiplied with exactly this combination. Therefore, we obtain Ye times V plus H divided by square root of two times the left-handed electron bar times the right-handed electron. And as you know, this uh, expression here times a constant is a mass term for an electron. And here we also see uh, that it is not only multiplied by a constant, but also by the Higgs field, which means that we have an interaction between the Higgs field and the electron. But let us go on for the other two terms. There is also the down quark uh, term, which has exactly the same structure. Yd for down quarks times V plus H divided by square root of two times down quark left times down quark right. And then there is finally the up quark term, Yu times V plus H divided by square root of two. And there we had this uh, multiplication with the epsilon tensor. The epsilon tensor is such that the upper component of the up uh, quark doublet is multiplied with the lower component of phi. And therefore we now get up quark left times up quark right times V plus H. And then we get for all of this also the Hermitian conjugate part. And so then we can define masses MF for all the fermions is defined as the corresponding Yukawa coupling YF times V divided by square root of two. And then the Yukawa Lagrangian simply becomes L Yukawa is equal to a sum over all the types of fermions, namely F equal electron, um, down quark and up quark. And each time we have mf times f bar f times, we can write this as times one plus x field divided by v. So here 
we assume that the Yukawa couplings are real C section 2. In section 2, where we discuss three generations, we will discuss in more details why we can assume that the Yukawa couplings are real and uh, what are further connections to this, but here we simply assume it. And then the mass terms are of course also real and in the sum of a term plus its complex conjugated, the coupling prefactor stays what it is and we just get this plus its Hermitian conjugate, which in the end gives just the full left plus right-handed F bar F. Yes. As you see, there are exactly three Yukawa couplings. In principle, they could be complex. Um, and there are three types of fermions, namely lepton, down quark, and up quark. And therefore, there are as many Yukawa couplings as fermions. So the answer is yes. And that will maybe change in three generations, because then the Yukawas will become matrices. Like the WEF, uh, be careful. <laughs> uh, we will discuss more about the role of the WEF and versus input parameters in the exercise sheet. But the WEF is, of course, an output, not an input. Uh, at least uh, the natural way to look at it is that the WEF is an output. Uh, the input would be the Higgs potential. Its minimum is a function of the uh, Higgs potential parameters. And so the WEF would be an output. But of course, you can uh, invert this relationship. Uh, but here, there are as many Yukawa couplings as there are masses, and uh, therefore you can regard the Yukawa couplings as input and the masses as output, or you can invert the relationship and regard the masses as input and the Yukawas as output. But here, there is nothing particularly deep about this, and this relationship will be much more complicated in the case of three generations. Okay, so we have obtained the Yukawa Lagrangian, and we see that uh, it gen sorry, there is a minus also. It generates mass terms for the fermions, quarks, and leptons, but not for the neutrino. And uh, along with the mass, there is always an interaction uh, of this form uh, H divided by V with the same prefactor. So let me. summarize then in total what do we have in the full standard model after electroweak symmetry breaking including this discussion but also the discussion from last week we have now the following particle content we have a massless spin one vector boson which is the photon we have massive in one uh, vector bosons, W plus minus, and the Z boson with masses MW and MZ. We have massive Higgs boson, the Higgs with spin zero, of course, and we have massive fermions up quark, down quark, and electron. And we have a massless neutrino, which exists only in a left-handed form. This is the particle content after spontaneous symmetry breaking. And there are unphysical degrees of freedom, namely the would-be Goldstone bosons, uh, which we have gauged away by using unitary gauge. And um, uh, the unphysical degrees of freedom of the vector bosons. And in all cases, by going through the derivations once again uh, from last week, last week we skipped that detail, but it's obvious that the same happens as with the fermions. Namely, each time the mass terms are accompanied by such a factor, 1 plus h divided by v, because initially, uh, the only thing that appears in the Lagrangian 
is such a combination. That means wherever you have a term with a vacuum expectation value, the term actually contains V plus H, or in other words, V times 1 plus H over V. Therefore, all the mass terms are accompanied by that factor. And so let me just write it down. So schematically, we have the mass term for the W plus minus times MW square, which would be accompanied by 1 plus H over V square. Similarly, the mass term for the Z boson MZ square times MZ square times 1 plus H over V. And also for the fermions, we have a fermion mass term which is linear squared times 1 plus H over V. So in all terms, the masses are accompanied by interactions with the Higgs bosons. such that the interaction of the Higgs with anything is always proportional to the mass. So, okay, let me just write it here as in the case of the fermions, that this interaction is proportional to mf over v. And similarly for the vector boson, so in all cases you get the relation that the interaction strength by which the Higgs field interacts with um, other fields for which it generates the mass, the interaction is proportional to the respective mass. This is, of course, a prediction of the Higgs mechanism of the standard model, and uh, that is being tested experimentally. So, then we have discussed the structure of spontaneous symmetry breaking in the electroweak standard model at three level for one generation. We have derived all the physical um, consequences of it, namely the masses of all particles. And uh, just remember that for each of those uh, fields and particles, the direct mass term would violate gauge invariance, but via the connection to the Higgs interactions, we get gauge invariant combinations of mass and interaction terms, and uh, in particular, we generate all the masses of spin one and spin one half particles. And the mass of the Higgs itself comes from the Higgs potential, and we have implicitly also calculated it. But now, having said all that, uh, let us generalize this discussion and um, look not only at the standard model, but at the more general structure of spontaneous symmetry breaking in gauge theories. That uh, more general understanding will also allow us to obtain a more um, convenient form of the standard model quantization compared to unitary gauge, namely the so-called RXI gauges, which are the gauges which are used in practical calculations. But I do not want to go directly to RXI gauges in the standard model, but I want to take a step back and do the general calculation first, because uh, we do not only want to discuss RXI gauges, but also a few physical um, consequences, which are better visible in the general setup. So let us discuss this. General mass generation and RXI gauges. So this chapter is a mix between interesting physics information and technicalities on gauge fixing. Let us start with something physical, namely generic spin one masses. So let us go away from the standard model and look at the generic gauge theory. A generic gauge theory uh, will be now a 
gauge theory with a simple gauge group, so there is only one gauge coupling and one set of vector fields, and we will just define it by specifying the covariant derivative. Capital D mu is normal D mu plus I times G times T A times V A mu. So uh, that means that we have one gauge coupling G, one set of generators T A. We do not specify what they are, but they will satisfy some Lie algebra relations. And we have one set of vector fields V A mu. And it doesn't matter what gauge group there is and how many gauge bosons there are. It is just some number. Okay. Then uh, in this generic gauge theory, we have some scalars. And in analogy to the standard model, let me assume these are complex scalar fields. Capital Phi with some index i. And again, we do not specify what is the nature of that index. It is just some set of fields. And we write it as small phi i plus v i. And uh, so here again, the vi should be the vacuum expectation value at three level. And uh, this should be small fluctuations around the vacuum. So in other words, in the vacuum, small phi i is 0. So small phi i parameterizes fluctuations around the vacuum, similar to the Higgs field here. And we do not put 1 over square root of 2, because in the generic case, we do not know what is the correct normalization factor. Therefore, we just put no normalization factor at all. And now we can look at gauge transformations. Gauge transformations of the scalars in general would be delta gauge and infinitesimal gauge transformation with some uh, parameter a. So you can, for any generator, you can do an infinitesimal gauge transformation of the scalars, phi i. And that would always be minus i times the generic gauge coupling times the generic generator T A times the Higgs field phi. And then the index structure, if you want the transformation of the component i, then you have here T A i j times the component phi j. Of course, uh, using the covariant derivative, the kinetic term uh, will be automatically gauge invariant under this gauge transformation. And we require the full uh, Lagrangian of that theory to be invariant under these gauge transformations. Now, the first uh, consequence that we can derive, which is interesting, is what is the behavior of the vacuum under gauge transformations? Does the behavior of the vacuum signals whether we have spontaneous symmetry breaking or not. Spontaneous symmetry breaking means that the vacuum is not invariant under gauge transformations. And therefore, we look at gauge transformations of the vacuum. So what is that? We take delta A, a gauge transformation of phi i, but go into the vacuum. And then what means? What does it mean? It means that on the right hand side, we plug in for the field the vacuum expectation value. And then we obtain minus i times g times t a i j v j. And this quantity is relevant because it signals whether we have spontaneous symmetry breaking or not. So up to the factor minus i, which is a normalization convention, let us give it a name. Let us call it small d. That will be like an order parameter. What is the index, index structure of d? d has one index a, and it has one index i. So that corresponds to how the vacuum uh, behaves under a gauge transformation in the gauge direction A. And the vacuum consists of many Higgs field components. Therefore, this behavior must have this index I corresponding to the scalar multiplets of the theory. And uh, what does it mean? You should view this as so, many, uh, so for each A, this is a vector in the space of Higgs fields. <coughs> 
and how many vectors are there? There are so many vectors as there are gauge fields in the theory. So for every gauge field or for every generator, you have a vector which tells you how the vacuum transforms under this particular gauge transformation. So vectors in field space for every A. And uh, these DAs, they are like order parameters for a spontaneous symmetry breaking. If they are all zero, then the vacuum is invariant under any gauge transformation. And if some of them are non-zero, then we have spontaneous symmetry breaking. Therefore, those are essential quantities which uh, tell us about the symmetry breaking structure. OK, so let's summarize this. We have this uh, order parameter, DAI, which are defined as G times TA, IJ, VJ. And we have spontaneous symmetry breaking if the DAI are non-zero. So you can view it as many different vectors, or you can view it as a matrix, a matrix with two indices, namely A and I. These two indices live in different spaces, so it's a non-diagonal matrix. And the question is, how many um, symmetries are actually spontaneously broken? In the sense, there are many generators. All the generators generate independent gauge transformations. In the standard model, for example, there are four generators for SU3 and U1. And how many linearly independent breakings are there in the standard model? Out of the four generators, three are broken, one is unbroken. What does it mean in terms of this order parameter? So the number of, the number of linearly independent, spontaneously broken generators is the number of how many linearly independent linear combinations can you form out of these vectors dA. And it must be real linear combinations because you are only allowed to do li real linear combinations of gauge bosons and generators. So uh, that the number of linearly independent DAs is simply the, the rank of this matrix. That is simply the rank of this matrix. And that can then be defined as the number of broken generators. Where there is just one small subtlety, you have to regard um, complex numbers as two by two matrices. Since uh, we are talking about real linear combinations, therefore a complex number is like a two-dimensional matrix, has a rank two. Okay, so for example, for the electroweak standard model, you would have here four Ds, namely the three TAs applied onto the vacuum and the hypercharge applied onto the vacuum. So these are four complex two-dimensional vectors. So in terms of real numbers, these are four four-dimensional real vectors. And uh, two out of the four are linearly dependent, and therefore uh, the overall number of independent ones is three. So this is how you see, in general, what is the symmetry structure of your vacuum. And uh, the small dA is introduced as an important building block in the study of spontaneous symmetry breaking. Now, having said that, we can look at the mass generation in the generic case.
and the mass comes from the interaction of the gauge bosons with the scalar fields and uh, that comes from the covariant derivative. So let us first evaluate the covariant derivative. Let's do it in the vacuum because that generates the masses by coupling the gauge bosons to the vacuum. Okay, so in the vacuum, the ordinary derivative doesn't matter and we get just plus i times g times the generators ta times the vector fields va mu applied onto the vacuum and the index structure, let's say if we put here the component i, then we have here tij times vj. And so what you see is that in the vacuum, the covariant derivative reduces exactly to that order parameter, namely we have here i times this p a i times v a mu. So that shows you that what remains is uh, in the vacuum either zero or a vector boson times that order parameter dA. Therefore, if we go to the Lagrangian, the Lagrangian contains the covariant derivative of all the scalar fields squared. And in the vacuum, we now get from this term the square of the above, the i drops out, and then we simply have v a mu times d a i times another v b mu times d b i complex conjugated, and we sum over the i corresponding to the square here of each uh, component i. So and that can be written in a more sy symmetric form by writing one half times v a mu v b mu times the symmetric combination d a i d b i star plus the same thing with a and b exchanged and we can define that as a mass matrix acting on the vector bosons. So we have derived here the structure of mass terms. We get a mass matrix M square AB with indices AB in the space of vector boson fields VA, VB, and the mass matrix square comes from the products of these order parameters. So let's write it uh, in a nice way. So we obtain M square AB is equal to d a i d b i star plus the same thing with a and b exchanged. And here it is again nice to go back to the definition of the d a's and plug it in because that is also illuminating. So if you plug in the definition, then we get the following. We get on the far left, we get v decker or v i complex conjugated or let's say, let's in general put v i decker. Then on the far right we have v j and in between we have gauge coupling g times generator t a times gauge coupling g times generator t b plus the same thing with a and b exchanged. So the mass matrix comes from uh, products of two generators times two gauge couplings multiplied to the left and right with V decker and V. So of course you know that the vector boson masses are proportional to the gauge coupling and proportional to the vacuum expectation value, but here you now see in full generality for any gauge theory how the mass matrix looks like. It is always this same structure. And you could go back and compare the electroweak standard model with that structure and you see it is exactly uh, the same. So what is now interesting, and let me squeeze that in here. This is a mass matrix. And what is interesting is the rank of the mass matrix because the rank is the number of um, 
independent non-zero eigenvalues and that corresponds to the, num to the number of massive gauge bosons. The non-zero eigenvalues correspond to the physical gauge boson masses, so the rank means how many gauge bosons will be massive. So the rank of this matrix uh, is interesting, but what do we know about the rank? M is here a product of the matrix D times itself, basically, and D is a matrix with a certain rank. So in general, the rank of the product of two matrices, if the rank of both is equal, will be again the same. If there are no uh, artificial or completely accidental cancellations, the rank of this will be the same as the rank of D. But it cannot, for sure, cannot be bigger. It can at most be smaller. But the rank is equal or smaller to the rank of D. Um, and so let me just squeeze that in here. Let us assume that there are no artificial accidental cancellations, and then the rank of m square ab is the same as the rank of d, which is the number of broken generators. And then for each spontaneously broken generator of the symmetry, we get one massive gauge boson. So you see all this that you already know here in completely general terms emerging. And uh, that is the physical information that I wanted to tell you. Now let us do something a little bit more technical, uh, which is, however, important in order to be able to calculate with a standard model. Namely, let us look at unphysical degrees of freedom, the so-called would-be Goldstone bosons. And that is easiest also here in the generic case. So um, in the literature, if you are very explicit, these objects are called would-be Goldstone bosons because uh, they are unphysical. Therefore, they can be gauged away, and they do not appear as actually observable particles. Um, but they appear in the same way as the ordinary Goldstone bosons in the case of a spontaneously broken symmetry. And uh, they become unphysical because we do not only have a spontaneously broken symmetry, but on top of it, we have gauge invariance and gauge redundancy, where we can gauge away certain degrees of freedom. And these are, in this case, the Goldstone bosons. I will often simply say Goldstone bosons and do not always spell out the would be, because it's just uh, too time consuming. OK, so let me define immediately uh, the general generic would-be Goldstone boson uh, in a way which is not directly uh, the same as the Goldstone bosons we have defined in the standard model, but uh, more generic. GA is defined as two times the real part of D, sorry, phi data I times I times D a I. Okay, so this is a definition where again this order parameter appears uh, times the scalar fields of the theory, and uh, here only uh, the, the fluctuation part of the scalar fields appear. And this projects out some components out of all the scalar fields. And which components are projected out? These are exactly those would be Goldstone bosons. The expression here is dimensionful. So the DAs, they are dimensionful objects because they contain the vacuum expectation value. So um, in order to de obtain the Goldstone bosons we typically use in the standard model, one would apply some normalization factors which uh, divide by the vacuum expectation value and so on to make the fields dimension 1 instead of dimension 2. But here on the generic level, we do not do that because we don't know what is the correct or most appropriate normalization factor. Therefore, we simply use this definition. 
What is an infinitesimal gauge transformation of these so defined would be Goldstone fields? Let's do delta gauge with uh, index B onto GA. So now we have two indices. I define, uh, okay, maybe let me add this point. I define for every generator a Goldstone field. But there are only a certain number of linearly independent DAs. Therefore, out of this construction, not all of the GAs are independent. Therefore, there is a certain number of linearly independent Goldstone fields, namely the same number as broken generators. And nevertheless, to make the notation uniform, I define the Goldstone fields for any A, and we should simply remember that we must not treat all of them as independent fields, but uh, we only use the notation uh, for convenience. Okay, uh, but anyway, we can for each of them define a gauge transformation with gauge group index B, because we know what is the gauge transformation of this. Uh, it is written here. So now we use the Deckard version of it, and uh, then we plug it in, uh, and we obtain two times real part of, then here minus G times phi uh, I dagger times TB times I times DA I. So here with the full index structure. All right. And here we have now the full capital phi, including the vacuum expectation value. And if we plug in here the um, vacuum expectation value, then what we observe is that we get here another D. We get once again this order parameter D here on the left, D times another D, here D with index B, here D with index A. Therefore, what we get is exactly the mass matrix. So we get something proportional to the mass matrix M square AB times um, a constant plus terms linear in the small phi fields. So the interesting thing is that the Goldstone bosons transform into a term which is field independent, a constant, plus field dependent terms. So we have assumed that we are in the vacuum and we are looking at small fluctuations around the vacuum. Therefore, terms involving V are much bigger than terms which are linear in a field because the field is a small fluctuation. Therefore, if you have here a gauge transformation of a very small fluctuating field and one term in the gauge transformation is simply a constant proportional to V square, the other term is much smaller then it tells you that by using that constant, you can gauge away the original Goldstone fields. Even with an infinitesimal gauge transformation, you can arrange it such that after the gauge transformation, this Goldstone field becomes zero. So in other words, you could solve the equation. Uh, so could be set equal to, let's say, minus the original uh, Goldstone field. And uh, because that matrix has the same rank as the broken generators, and here there are uh, also as many independent Goldstone fields as there are broken generators, so this is an equation that has a solution. So by solving the equation, you can gauge away all Goldstone fields. All GA can be gauge transformed to zero. And this is the so-called unitary gauge. 
the small exercise proofs that the unitary gauge is always possible. Unitary gauge in which all these would-be Goldstone bosons are zero. And that also tells us that these would-be Goldstone fields are unphysical fields. However, we now want to look at general gauges where we do not gauge them away, but we keep them in the theory. And then our next few tasks have to do with how do these Goldstone fields appear in the Lagrangian and what one can we do uh, with interpreting the corresponding terms. Yes. Yes, okay. So that is a detail which I didn't write down and maybe we don't have to write it down. Um, the small phi are, are now treated as the dynamical fields of our theory. Uh, therefore, only they have a gauge transformation. So we would say that gauge transformation of the full phi is the same as the gauge transformation of the little phi because obviously the gauge transformation of these numbers doesn't exist. So uh, if you have a gauge transformation of that, uh, the small phi inherits the same gauge transformation, whereas the V uh, is, there is no gauge transformation of V defined. And that explains it. Okay. So this establishes the structure of Goldstone bosons. And the fact that they can be gauged away implies uh, that they are unphysical. But now let's keep them in the theory and look at the Lagrangian in the general case where the Goldstone bosons appear. So then we have this Lagrangian, which contains the kinetic term of all the scalar fields phi i from which we obtain the masses. And we have already seen what the mass term is. Namely, it contains this nice mass square matrix, m square ab. But there we have neglected all the other terms which do not have that form. What happens if we fully expand this expression? If we fully expand that expression, we obtain the following. We obtain, on the one hand, the ordinary derivative, small d mu of capital Phi I. Then there are mixed terms between the ordinary derivative and the gauge boson interaction terms of that. And the mixed terms have exactly the form that we obtain derivative of these Goldstone boson fields times the vector boson fields. Because if you expand it back, then you see uh, that this means the derivative of phi decker, ordinary derivative of phi decker, times i times g times the gauge bosons times the generator. So it's exactly the mixed term coming from expanding the covariant derivative, just uh, written by using the definition above. And then the last term is the one for the mass matrix, which we have already obtained, 1 half m square ab times va vb. Plus higher order terms. So these are only the bilinear terms, bilinear in the fields, and the interaction terms, which are trilinear in the fields, and quartic, they are neglected. Um, but this is the top part of the Lagrangian, which would correspond to the free theory. And so here, then, there are the nice mass terms, which are uh, what we think would give rise to the masses of the gauge bosons. Here, there are kinetic terms for all the fields. But here, there are mixed terms mixed terms, bilinear mixed terms between scalar fields and vector fields. And those mixed terms are, first of all, difficult to interpret. And even if we can interpret them, they are uh, a drawback. And they make calculations more cumbersome and complicated. And therefore, we should discuss those mixed terms in a more dedicated way.
me clean the blackboard for a moment. So this is the final result of that subsection. We have discussed generic spin one masses. We have obtained a mass squared matrix. But if we incorporate the Goldstone bosons and do not choose unitary date, then there are mixed terms which would uh, make it difficult to interpret what the mass term actually means. So in order to cope with that situation, we discuss another kind of gauge fixing, namely the so-called RxI gauges. And again, we do it first in the generic case, generic RxI gauges. So in QED, we often do the following. We must also use a gauge fixing in QED. There is something similar to unitary gauge in QED where we directly gauge away on physical fields, but very often we want a Lorentz covariant gauge fixing that looks like this. L fix is equal to minus 1 over 2 xi times d mu a mu square. This breaks gauge invariance in QED, but is Lorentz invariant, and then we quantize QED in this way. OK, let us now uh, say maybe we can use the same gauge fixing also in our case here if we have spontaneous symmetry breaking. And actually, that is possible. We can use the same gauge fixing here. But if we do that, then in our Lagrangian, those mixed terms remain and uh, they remain a drawback in actual calculations and also in interpreting the physical degrees of freedom in our theory. Therefore, people have thought about um, how to obtain maybe an improved gauge fixing which is adapted to the case of spontaneous symmetry breaking. And uh, that improved gauge fixing should on the one hand be kind of similar to the one in QED where d mu a mu or something like that appears because that breaks gauge invariance. But at the same time, they wanted to get rid of the mixing terms also directly by using a proper gauge fixing term. And that is possible. And let me immediately tell you the solution which is the so-called RxI gauge fixing term. It looks like this in the generic case, 1 over 2 xi times d mu v a mu. So like in QED, but then we have an additional term proportional to the Goldstone fields, namely minus zeta times g a and the whole thing is squared. So you have here a linear combination of the, the, the d mu a mu for each gauge field times the co uh, minus the corresponding Goldstone field. And here there are two coefficients, xi and zeta. And let us work out uh, what that gauge fixing term will give us in the end. It will give minus 1 over 2 xi times d mu v a mu square, the same as in QED. Then a mixed term plus zeta divided by xi times d mu v a mu times g a minus zeta square divided by 2 xi times g a square. And now here you see that this gauge fixing term produces also a mixing between the vector boson and the scalar boson, namely v a and g a with a derivative. And that has exactly the same structure as the mixed term coming out of the covariant derivative. Um, 
both appear with plus, but once the derivative is here and once the derivative is on the other field, and therefore if you add the two, you get something which is a total derivative, in other words, zero in the action. In order to cancel this, zeta and xi must be equal. So if zeta is equal to xi, the mixed terms drop out. And that is the Rxi gauge fixing, where you have this term with xi and zeta, and zeta is in the end set equal to xi. So then we can discuss really the full bilinear Lagrangian in the uh, gauge theory with Rxi gauge fixing instead of unitary gauge fixing. Uh, maybe let me do it with a little bit more space. Here. So then we look at the bilinear Lagrangian for the scalar and vector field sector of the theory in our Xi gauge. Bilinear means that we are looking at the free theory, which gives us uh, the interpretation in terms of Fox basis of free particles, uh, which then have interactions in terms of Feynman diagrams. Um, and so what we need is, first of all, the covariant derivative term. And on the other hand, this uh, Rxi gauge fixing term. And from all of this, we only need the bilinear part. And what do we get if we do it? We uh, from the covariant derivative, we have this here, which we already discussed. And uh, from the uh, Rxi gauge fixing, we get the other two terms. So we get three terms plus three terms, but two cancel. So we get four terms in the end. On the one hand, the ordinary kinetic term of all the scalar fields, capital phi or small phi, doesn't matter because the vacuum expectation value has no ordinary derivative. Then we have, uh, let's, let's put maybe the mass term over there, minus um, GA, so minus one half GA squared, the last term on the right for zeta equal psi, which would be a Goldstone boson mass term connected with a kinetic term for Goldstone bosons. You have ordinary kinetic and mass terms for the scalar fields and the Goldstone bosons become massive. Then the mixed terms drop out and we have a kinetic term minus 1 over 2 xi for the gauge fields, dVa square and the mass term plus 1 half m square ab va vb. And this is now very easy uh, to interpret and very nice. So as I said, here we have kinetic plus mass terms for the would-be Goldstone bosons. And the mass terms are, uh, sorry, did I miss anything? I think I did, yeah. Sorry about this, there is a remaining xi in the numerator, right? I forgot about that. If we set xi equal to zeta, then there still remains a factor xi here in the numerator. So we get xi dependent masses for the Goldstone bosons. And here we get an ordinary gauge fixing term like in QED. And here we then get the mass terms for vector fields. And there are no mixed terms 
Therefore, if you now pass to the quantization of this free theory, what happens is you have a free Lagrangian. Free means bilinear Lagrangian with linear equations of motion without any interactions. And this Lagrangian contains parts for scalar fields and parts for spin one fields. And all of those different parts of the Lagrangian have exactly the form of ordinary quantum field theory one lectures for scalar fields and for massless or massive vector fields. And therefore, the quantization of this Lagrangian can proceed exactly in the way as uh, we discussed in the last semester in quantum field theory one lectures. And the outcome is, of course, the identical one and uh, the procedure as well. So let me just write this down. Like in QED with this gupta bleuler formalism. Uh, we can quantize as in quantum field theory 1b lecture. For the part involving the gauge bosons, we get neg negative or indefinite norm states. in the same way as in QED, when we quantize with such a Lorentz covariant gauge fixing. These indefinite norm states, partially negative norm states, which have no physical interpretation. They are, of course, unphysical degrees of freedom. And like in QED at the time, we therefore must define a subspace of the Fox space, which corresponds to a Hilbert space with positive norm on which we can uh, interpret physics. Must define a positive norm physical Hilbert space. as a subspace. And how we are going to do it is a question for later. But at this point, we first of all see that uh, these are xi gauge fixing uh, terms are possible. They have they are easy to formulate in the generic case, therefore also in each concrete case, like in the standard model, we could easily write them down. And if we use them, then we get a Lagrangian which can be very well interpreted. In particular, now there is no mixing between spin one and spin zero anymore, and therefore the mass term for spin one can of course be interpreted really as the physical masses of the spin one particles. Right. You're right, and they correspond to these indefinite norm states, which uh, then ultimately cannot be part of the physical Hilbert space. But we cannot, at this point, see in an obvious way, unless you are very experienced, maybe, <laughs> how they end up in this unphysical sector of, of the space. What that? They are simply set to zero. Right. And let me compare this maybe to the case in QED. In the case of QED, you could, for example, choose axial gauge, where you set a3 equal to 0. If you set A3 equal to 0 in QED, that is possible. If you do it, there are no unphysical degrees of freedom anymore. You know, uh, Then you can uh, write down the Lagrangian with A3 being set to 0. Uh, 
And uh, if you do that, uh, then you are able to quantize that Lagrangian. And if you quantize it, there are only physical degrees of freedom in it. Uh, the resulting quantum theory immediately contains only positive norm states, which correspond to transverse photon degrees of freedom. And uh, however, you can also do a Lorentz covariant gauge, which is this uh, minus 1 over 2 psi d mu a mu square. Additional term in the Lagrangian, so you do not gauge anything to zero, but you add this non-gauge invariant term to the Lagrangian. Then you can also quantize the advantage in QED is that the Lagrangian is the Lorentz covariant. Uh, but the drawback is that you end up with unphysical degrees of freedom because now you have four gauge boson degrees of freedom in your Lagrangian, but the physical photon contains only two degrees of freedom, namely two transverse polarizations. So there are two unphysical degrees of freedom in your theory description. And if you do the quantization, then you end up uh, with states with negative norm and uh, states with positive norm, which are nevertheless unphysical and uh, you need to define that uh, subspace structure as we did in the gupta bleuler formalism. And here it's exactly the same. You can either use unitary gauge, where you gauge away the unphysical degrees of freedom. Uh, that is all very nice. And it's even better than in axial gauge, because unitary gauge actually is Lorentz covariant, so that is not a problem. So, uh, but then you have only positive norm states in your theory, or you use R psi gauge, which is similar to uh, that gauge in QED, so then the unphysical degrees of freedom remain in the theory description. That has certain advantages, and uh, you will get negative norm states in your quantum theory, and you need to define the subspace structure. So it's completely analogous. Mm -hmm. But how much of a problem is it to make the theory non lorentz covariant? And then have to put in some work to see that the physical part is lorentz covariant? Now we indicated that in the last semester. Um, it was, we didn't maybe call it axial gauge, but we looked at the case where we uh, did this. Um, um, we removed out of the photon quantum field operator the unphysical degrees of freedom. Then the quantum field of the photon contained only uh, creation operators for transverse photons. And then that photon field operator was not Lorentz covariant anymore, but it fulfilled a certain other relation, which is similar to axial gauge. And so then we argued what we need to do in order to get Lorentz invariant interactions, which corresponded to gauge invariant interactions. Um, and here, you do not see at this point what is the disadvantage of unitary gauge and why we would like to prefer our psi gauges, but I will tell you at some other point. Anyway, for the interpretation and for our purposes that we have used last week, the unitary gauge is perfectly fine, and uh, therefore our results that we have stated for it are, uh, of course, correct. Good. Let us go on. Let us go on. You know what is now going to happen. Namely, we need to discuss this issue of positive versus negative norm states in your theory. And we need to discuss how to extract a physical subspace of states. And the formalism for that is BRST formalism. So now we need to look at the generic BRST structure. And that ties in uh, nicely with the discussion of the other lecture, where we discussed BRST for general Young-Mills theories without spontaneous symmetry breaking. And there I already alluded to that the situation changes a little bit in this context. And now you see how it changes. So let me just contrast this once again. Unitary gauge 
uh, here we have only physical degrees of freedom. And therefore, only positive norm states. So we can directly interpret everything uh, in terms of uh, physics. Direct interpretation is possible. But let me now tell you the drawback. The drawback is that uh, in renormalization, you have some difficulties. Because the propagators, Feynman rules for propagators of vector bosons, they behave like uh, p mu, p nu divided by p square. So they do not go to zero for infinitely high energies, and that messes up the so called power counting in loop diagrams. In other words, the divergences are much worse than uh, uh, in other cases. Okay. Uh, in contrast, are psi gauge. So, see above, we have here uh, indefinite norm states, just like we had in quantum field theory one in the case of QED. This happens now all over the place. And uh, we need to construct a physical subspace. And we do that by using BRST invariance. So, we need BRST invariance to obtain a structure in our theory which allows a consistent definition of this physical subspace. When I say consistent, I mean consistent with interactions. to define a physical subspace. It should be consistent with interactions. In other words, interactions do not bring us out of that physical subspace. And that is in particular manifested in the unitarity of the physical S matrix. So the S matrix must be restricted onto the physical subspace, then it is some operator on the physical subspace. It shouldn't lead out of the physical subspace, and it should be unitary on the physical subspace. These are very non-trivial demands. And in order to fulfill those demands, we have to use the BRST formalism. Therefore, let us go through that structure. So let us directly write down the BRST transformations. We need to introduce ghosts, so-called fatiev popov ghosts, called CA of X, ghost fields for each generator A. Then we define the BRS transformations in terms of this operator small s small s generates infinitesimal BRS transformations. And we define it such that if s acts onto any field, phi, then we get Ca times the gauge transformation in the direction A of that corresponding object for phi is any of the fields, V, A, M, U, or scalar field or other meta fields. Okay, so for all the ordinary fields of the theory, the BRST transformation is just a gauge transformation where the transformation parameter 
is replaced by the 40th Pope of Ghost Field. Then the BRST transformation of the ghosts themselves are defined such that S square acting onto phi is always zero for all fields phi. And that uniquely fixes the BRST transformation of the 40th Pope of ghosts. They are proportional to the uh, ghost square times structure constants. But uh, let us not write this down. You can find this in the other lecture. Then we have also anti-ghosts and auxiliary fields. C bar A of x and B A of x. The B A of x is an auxiliary field which can always be eliminated by its equations of motion but it's useful to introduce it as an abbreviation and whenever it appears in the Lagrangian, you can at the end replace it by its value coming from the equations of motion. And they are defined such that S acting on CA is B and S acting on B is zero, such that again S square acting on anything is zero. OK, and then using this formalism, we have now a way to introduce a PRST invariant uh, RxI gauge fixing. Namely, we introduce the gauge fixing not in isolation, but the gauge fixing must be accompanied by certain interaction terms for the ghosts, such that the total combination of them is BRST invariant. And that can be achieved by writing the whole combination of gauge fixing plus ghost terms as a total BRST transformation of something, because S square is zero. Therefore, if we have S of anything, uh, the BRST transformation of that will be S squared of something and therefore zero. So this is the generic way to introduce a BRST invariant gauge fixing term. And we should now put into the square bracket something such that its BRST transformation generates the arcsi gauge fixing term. And then inevitably there will be some extra terms which will be necessary ghost interactions that make the whole theory BRST invariant and which then allow these things here. And what can we put there? It's standard psi over 2 times BA, BA with this auxiliary field plus BA times FA, where FA is the desired gauge fixing term. Which was here D mu VA mu minus zeta times these generic Goldstone fields GA. So if we define it in this way, then we get here, uh, uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, misprint, sorry, uh, misprint, CA bar, CA bar. So if we now evaluate the square bracket, then what we obtain from the first term, BRS transformation of C bar gives B, BRST transformation of B gives zero. So the only thing that we obtain from the first term is psi over two times BA, BA. And from the second term, we obtain the BRST transformation of the ghost gives BA times FA. And then we uh, get minus, minus because S and C bar are fermionic. So we get minus C bar A times the BRST transformation of the gauge fixing term FA. And now you see what I told you before, the B is an auxiliary field. So it appears in the Lagrangian in this trivial way. So the Euler Lagrange equation of motion for BA is simply the following. 
So there is no derivative term involving B. It's just uh, a non-derivative term. So the Euler-Lagrange means derivative of L with respect to B must be zero. Then we have psi times B plus F is zero. In other words, B is minus one over psi times FA. And if we plug it in, then we get the famous minus one over two psi times FA square minus C bar A times BRS transformation of FA. And then you see that here, in principle, you could choose any desired gauge fixing term, but you can choose the arc psi gauge fixing term. Then you reproduce here the desired arc psi gauge fixing that we want. And here, as I said, you inevitably obtain something else which contains ghosts. And uh, whatever is the BRST transformation of this FA must be put here. It might be zero in some cases, but here it's not zero. And anyway, it's something proportional to ghosts because here is an anti-ghost and all the BRST transformations are proportional to some ghosts. Therefore, that corresponds to a ghost-anti-ghost -ghost interaction with something to be evaluated. So let's simply comment on that. This is the desired RXI gauge fixing term. Ghost interactions needed for unitary S matrix. Okay, and using this, we have now the full um, gauge fixing plus ghost Lagrangian of our theory. We can come back to the physical interpretation. And here I will just do a sketch and refer also to the exercise. And the exercise in turn also refers to the other lecture, quantum field theory one and quantum field theory two, where we dis have discussed exactly the same structure, first for QED in the last semester, and then for generic Young-Mills theories in this semester. And here we just look at the sketch of the changes for the spontaneously broken case. So first of all, we can quantize this. like in the Gupta-Bleuler method. We will uh, obtain negative norm states. We already said that. But the same is not only true for the unphysical Goldstone and vector boson degrees of freedom, but also for the fadeyev popov ghosts. They also contain indefinite norm, partially negative norm. Um, and the physical fields in the free theory, to say it simply, they are defined by the linearized BRS transformations as linearized where you neglect all terms which are quadratic or higher powers in the dynamical fields. Only uh, for the free theory, only the linearized parts in the BRST transformations matter. And uh, then the physical states could be basically written as a quotient space kernel of these linearized BRS transformations divided by the image of the linearized uh, BRST transformations. And then you get the following structure, and I think I can sketch that here. Massless photon on the one hand, and massive vector bosons and Goldstone bosons would be Goldstone bosons on the other hand. So what is the structure of the linearized BRST transformations? <coughs> 
in the massless case that we discussed last semester, you could decompose a photon field into a scalar part, S mu, plus a longitudinal part, L mu, plus two transverse degrees of freedom, T mu, uh, one and two, corresponding to the polarization vectors epsilon mu in the decomposition of the corresponding field operator. Okay, and if you discuss that, then for example, the, for a massless photon, um, what happens if you do d mu a mu in the massless case, d mu a mu, uh, the scalar thing would be proportional to a derivative, then uh, that gives zero, and so this d mu a mu only reproduces the longitudinal part of the photon field, and all the other parts, that scalar part and the transverse part, they are transverse. And then by looking at the details, you will see that the linearized BRS transformation behaves as follows. So the transverse degrees of freedom, they are mapped to zero, so they are BRST invariant. Then on the other hand, the anti-ghost under BRST becomes B, but B is eliminated by the equations of motion to d mu a mu, and d mu a mu, here is the longitudinal degree of freedom. And on the other hand, the scalar degrees of freedom goes into the ghost. And then you have here a BRST quartet. Let me write it here. BRST quartet, which is unphysical, because this is not BRST invariant because it transforms into this. This is in the image of BRST and therefore also unphysical. This is not BRST invariant and this is in the image and therefore all of them are unphysical. And here you have physical states. Physical states which are BRST invariant and which are not in the image of the BRST operator. So this is the structure in QED as we have discussed it. Now, what happens here? Here we can again decompose A mu as a scalar part plus a longitudinal part plus two transverse parts. But because it is massive, uh, the structure of these scalars and longitudinal, they are different. So here, uh, according to our polarization vectors that we have defined elsewhere, uh, we would say the longitudinal actually is um, um, the longitudinal is defined also in a transverse way. So the polarization vector is longitudinal only in the three-dimensional sense, but the fourth component is defined such that it still uh, is transverse, whereas this can be written as the derivative of something else. And then if you look at the BRST transformations, then you see that under the linearized BRST transformations, again, the transverse degrees of freedom, they are mapped to zero. However, now the longitudinal degree of freedom is also mapped to zero, which means that we have now three physical vector degrees of freedom, transverse and longitudinal, where longitudinal is defined in that sense, different from this sense here. And then we also have a BRST quartet, Namely, what happens if we start from an anti-ghost? The anti-ghost becomes B, but B will be eliminated to a linear combination of D mu, V mu, and the Goldstone field. So C bar becomes, uh, becomes the scalar plus Goldstone. And on the other hand, the scalar itself goes into the ghost. And then you see that the goldstone is unphysical because it is in the image. The scalar degree of freedom is unphysical because it's not BRS invariant, and the ghost and anti-ghost, they are also unphysical. So you see here how the degrees of freedom change their structure. The longitudinal becomes physical and was before unphysical and the goldstone degrees of freedom, they go into the image of the BRST transformations, even in the linearized form, and therefore they become unphysical.
and looking at this in detail is your uh, job for the exercise. But anyway, I think this is quite beautiful that this uh, maybe a little bit abstract formalism can really also tell you about the physical structure of the degrees of freedom. Okay, if we have, uh, yeah, we have only three minutes of time, but maybe I can just tell you a little bit how it looks like in the actual standard model. Okay, so very quickly. So, in the electroweak standard model, we have in general the following covariant derivative of our Higgs doublet in the standard model. So we are now back in the standard model and capital Phi denotes the well-known two-component Higgs doublet. And we now evaluate this covariant derivative in general, not in unitary gauge. We discussed the last time how it works in unitary gauge, and here the differences are minimal, and I will immediately give you the result. You get the ordinary derivative plus i, and then in the upper component you have mw times the w plus mu field, and in the lower component minus mz divided by square root of 2 times the z mu field. And you can uh, collect the terms in a different way, namely the uh, ordinary component of, uh, okay, this is only the linear part, of course. So uh, products of fields are neglected. But then let's split the derivatives into the derivatives of the unphysical Goldstone field and the physical Higgs field. Then for the physical Higgs field, we simply have in the lower component derivative h divided by square root of 2. And then we have the following vector, which now contains the vector boson terms and the derivatives of the Goldstone fields. So for example, in the upper component, we have the derivative of g plus, plus i times mw times w plus mu. Okay, so this linear combination. And in the lower component, we have i divided by square root of 2. And then we have, on the one hand, the derivative of the neutral Goldstone field, g0. And on the other hand, minus mz times z mu. Okay. And that's it. And then you see now that actually there are certain linear combinations emerging, namely a linear combination between Goldstone derivatives and vector fields. And it is only those linear combinations uh, which appear. W does not appear uh, in isolation. Derivative of Goldstone doesn't appear in isolation. They only appear in terms of this linear combination. So this typical form, derivative of Goldstone plus vector field. And then if we square this in the Lagrangian that appears squared, then of course what happens is we get the square of the upper component plus the square of the imaginary part plus the square of the real part. Therefore we get exactly the squares of those particular linear combinations and that will create the famous mixed terms that should be cancelled by our psi gauge. So let me also say this. This will give rise to mixed terms in the square of d mu phi. And so then I will just write down the arc psi gauge fixing for the standard model, and then I think we can stop. So we would have 1 over 2 psi a for the photon times f a square for the photon minus 1 over 2 psi z times f z square for the z minus 1 over 1 psi w 
times F plus F minus for the W boson, and then this is D mu A mu for the photon. This is the same for the Z, D mu Z plus the corresponding linear combination, which cancels exactly that mixing term, which is minus zeta z times mz times Goldstone field G0. And here the F plus would be d mu w plus mu for the w boson, plus the corresponding Goldstone term to cancel the mixed term here, minus i times mw times g0, uh, times zeta w. And then for zeta i equal xi i, the mixed terms drop out. And then you have it. This is the arc side gauge fixing for the electroweak standard model with exactly those particular terms. And if we use them and set xi equal to zeta, then uh, we have the nicest Lagrangian for the quantization of the electroweak standard model. And like in the generic case, this will automatically generate particular for the popov ghost interactions via BRST invariants. They are unique by applying that formalism and can be evaluated and then we obtain certain interactions between Fatih Popov ghosts. But let us not go there. I will add this uh, small information the next time. Okay, but let us stop here. Thanks and see you in the afternoon.